Welcome back to the Agora Cafe for water and philosophy because I'm filming, well, recording uh, this video and the last two back to back, even though I'll be posting them spread out over over three weeks to keep you tantalized like Scheherazade. But, um, uh, you know, so I've already gone through my coffee and I don't feel like making more tonight. Um, so I'm thrown back on water. Coffee and water are the only things I have to drink in the house. That's kind of depressing. Um, uh, I need to get some more groceries delivered, I guess. Um, there's no alcohol in the house either. That is, well, I've got some rubbing alcohol underneath the, uh, the sink. Um, but I'm not that desperate yet. Um, uh, anyway, so this is uh, part three of a uh, of a three part series. Um, it turned out to be a three part series. Uh, my expanded version of my, though not the final, as yet to be fully expanded version that I hope to complete at some point uh, between now and the grave. But um, uh, you know, for now, the expanded version of my uh, presentation on Austro-Libertarian themes in uh, three uh, Prague authors. So part one was on Karl Chopek, part two is on Franz Kafka, and part three is on Yaroslav Hasek. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Kafka is very popular. You can find many editions of his writings, um, many translations, lots of work on him. Uh, Chopik and Hasek, although there certainly is stuff written on them, they're a bit more obscure. Most stuff, uh, most of this stuff is is out of print in English. Uh, I imagine more of it is in print in in the Czech Republic, um, but that's no help to those of us who do not read Czech. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, this guy's not quite the same as although you know. Uh, just as as Chopik is famous for one major work, R U R, Awesome's Universal Robots, so uh, Hashik is famous for one major work, The Good Soldier Schweik, which people often call the Good Soldier Schweik, giving it the German spelling and pronunciation. But in um, uh, yeah, in um, uh, in Czech, it's Schweik. Uh, it's a Schweik, as they say in Romulan. Um, some of you will get that. Um, uh, there was also a, you know, a, a pretty faithful movie or pair of movies made of that book. Um, uh, also, you know, Orson Welles made an interesting movie of, of Kafka's The Trial. Um, uh, I'm not showing clips from any of these things, any of these movies, because uh, you know, when I uh, when I had that um, my video. Uh, uh, with clips from the Cyrano de Bergerac uh, film, which is in the public domain in this country, it got blocked in France um, and in various French speaking countries legally entangled with France. And um, I you know, don't want this blocked anywhere, so I won't, uh, I won't show any clips. Uh, but uh, anyway, there, uh, a number of these works have been made into uh, movies. Um, the uh, uh, the um, the White Plague, uh, Chopik's um, uh, uh, novel was a novel or a play, uh, whatever it was. Actually, it's not one of his best works. Again, uh, but it uh, his his uh, his story about the his parable about the rise of fascism and treated like a disease was actually shown at the um, at the Mises Institute um, at the. Uh, 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 at the instigation of Jeff Tucker and myself. Um, uh, so that's a, but, uh, you know, that's not one of the best movies, not one of the best books, despite the uh, value of its message. Um, and anyway, that was a long time ago. Anyway, um, uh, so on to our, uh, our third uh, 
character. Okay, um, so now we come to the third and, and last of our uh, uh, of our three Prague authors. Yaroslav Hasek was actually an anarchist. He wasn't just someone who flirted with anarchism the way that uh, Chopik and Kafka quietly did. He was actually a full-fledged anarchist. Uh, he was more the communist than the individualist uh, variety. He used to, um, he tried to get his wife to read Kropotkin. Um, she wasn't particularly interested. Um, but his stories resonate with Austro-Libertarian themes in any case. Um, and Cecil Parrott, who is Hasek's biographer, and the, um, you know, we sort of was the, uh, you know, for a long time, and maybe in some sense still is the chief Anglophone authority on Hasek. He wrote Hasek's biography. He wrote a book on Hasek's literary work. He's the translator and editor of a number of Hasek's works. He's a bit of an ass. Uh, uh, here's a quotation from Parrott. Most of us, at least those of us who have been used to living under stable governments, can with difficulty repress a shudder of horror when we read the word anarchist. And he refers to anar Hasek's anarchism as a symptom of utter irresponsibility, a pathological craving for exhibitionism and psychopathy. You know, so you wonder why he decides to devote so much of his career to, um, uh, you know, to uh, tr translating, editing, and writing about the works and the life of someone he seems to have such a poor opinion of. Um, well, I, you know, I'm reminded of uh, of um, a, uh, I think it was Robert Sharples who devoted his career to writing about the um, uh, the uh, leading Aristotelian of late antiquity, Alexander Aphrodisius. His whole career was devoted to them. And one time I remember Sharples saying, I can't remember what he said it, whether I, I heard him say it or whether I just read this somewhere. He said he didn't think that much of Alexander of Aphrodisius. I thought, well, very odd to devote your career to someone you don't. Care about. I mean, you are, you are sort of carving out a um, an area of specialization if no one else is working on it to the same extent. But still, uh, you know, I would hate to devote a substance of uh, all or most of my career to uh, some thinker that I thought so poorly of. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, so. Uh, uh, in 1907, he becomes editor of the anarchist journal Comuna, which from the name you can guess is a communist anarchist journal. And in 1911, he uh, founded what uh, uh, was called the, um, he called the Party for Moderate Progress Within the Bounds of the Law, uh, which was basically a way of lampooning electoral politics. Uh, he ran you know, sort of mock campaigns, a sort of like anarchist street theater. In a way, he was sort of like the vermin supreme of his day. Uh, you know, the demands of the party included things like down with freedom of speech and voters use your ballot to protest against the earthquake in Mexico. And some other examples that aren't uh, on this list here. Um, uh, he said that, that alcoholism should no longer be optional. It should be legally mandatory. Um, uh, he said that uh, the state should nationalize all the janitors the way they are in Russia, where every janitor doubles as a police informant. Um, he said that everyone who votes for the party for moderate progress within the bounds of law should receive a pocket aquarium. Um, and he put an advertisement in the paper uh, saying, wanted uh, a respectable young man who is willing to defame members of the opposite parties. Um, uh, also had this protest that it was, it was unjust for a milkman's dog, which patiently and faithfully draws a cart with provisions to be called Nero, or a Yorkshire Terrier, which has never injured anyone and has never tyrannical to anybody to be called Caesar. Uh, these are injustices. And so one of the, one of the demands of um, the party was to redress this injustice toward animals. Um, uh, Hashik himself was apparently involved in um, uh, uh, in a kind of somewhat illicit trade in dogs himself. Um, 
as one of his examples of uh, moderate progress within the bounds of law, he said, he talked about some famous bridge who was named after, I forget who was named after, but he said, here's what I mean by moderate progress. This guy had to be born, then he had to live his life, then he had to die, then there had to be urban renewal, and then the bridge got named after him. He said, that's the pace at which progress should pr proceed. Anyway, so this whole thing was just sort of lampooning politics and um, uh, not all of, of the writings and speeches associated with this um, uh, with this uh, movement are in, in print, but in, at least in English. But some of them are. Some of them are collected in um, in uh, Parrot's anthology, The Red Commissar and Other Stories. Others are collected in a hard-to-find communist era uh, publication called Little Stories from a Great Master. And I think yeah, some of the other ones may have been published in some other source, um, but they're worth tracking down. They're, uh, you know, they're quite funny. Anyway, in 1915, he gets drafted into World War I. People often think he volunteered for it because they read that he was a one-year volunteer, but this was a rather Orwellian term. Uh, a one-year volunteer was not a kind of volunteer. It was a kind of draftee. Um, uh, what it meant was that uh, if you were willing to pay for the costs of some of your own supplies, so if you volunteered in that sense, uh, if you could afford to do that, then your term of enlistment would be reduced from three years to one. So if you volunteer some money, you only have to serve one year. So you're a one year volunteer. Um, but you know, you have to serve in the army just whether it's one year or three years depends on whether you can manage to cough up the dough. So he somehow managed to cough up the dough. I'm not sure how, but probably through some illicit or dubious means. Um, so he, he's, uh, he's drafted in World War I. He gets captured at the Russian front, whereupon he defects to the Bolsheviks. And uh, the Bolsheviks actually make him a minor Soviet official. And, you know, some of his adventures, real or imaginary, are chronicled in his in a series of stories called the Red Commissar, um, which is the uh, um, same book that has some of some of those Party of Moderate Progress pieces. It also has some prequels to the Good Soldier Shvake, which are far inferior to the actual Good Soldier Shvake. Um, in 1920, uh, the Russians send him back to Prague, telling him that it was his, his job to build the proletarian revolution. Um, and so he returned to Prague and what he did was uh, write a bunch of satirical stuff and drink a lot, which I guess was his contribution to building the proletarian revolution. It's not clear to you know, exactly what his, um, uh, you know, what his attitude was toward the, you know, toward the Soviet Union. Um, I mean, he was willing to you know, he was willing to serve as a commissar for them. He would rather be a commissar than a prisoner of war. He seems to be an, have been an adaptable and flexible guy, um, uh, but not someone who really took that kind of duty very seriously, apparently. Um, uh, there's an interesting contrast. By the way, here's another, you know, I had postage stamps from the last two. Here's a postage stamp from uh, for him, although in this case, uh, the other ones were Czechoslovak, postage stamps. This one is a Soviet postage stamp. You can see it says post to SSSR at the top, um, uh, you know, USSR post and the bottom Yaroslav Gashek because things that are G in Russian are H in Czech. That's one of the systematic uh, uh, changes when you go from one Slavic language to another is, uh, you know, um, that's why Prague, which is um, is sort of uh, is is Praha in um, in Czech, uh, sort of this and uh, knigi, which is the word for books in Russian, is knihi in um, uh, in Czech. That's why when I was in Prague, I was able to recognize a bookstore because it said knihi in front, and I had had a year of Russian, mostly forgotten in college, but I remembered knigi as books, and I saw knihi, and I thought, aha, this is, must be a bookstore, and I was right. Um, so. I remembered a little bit. Um, anyway, so that's why it says Gashek rather than uh, Hashek, if you can 
read the Cyrillic there, which uh, I can still read Cyrillic, even if I can't always tell you what the words mean. Well, if I can hardly ever tell you what the words mean. Um, uh, anyway, and I said posta up there. Of course, it's not posta, it would be pochta. Um, I'm assuming pochta means postal, but I don't know. Um, anyway, so a difference among our three authors, interesting difference is in Chopic, they tend to be well-meaning blunderers who are inevitably out of their depth. In Kafka, authority figures are terrifying, omnipresent, anonymous ciphers. And in Hashek, they're buffoons, rascals, idiots, sharpers, and lunatics. Um, so Hashek and Chopik are maybe a little bit closer to each other. Remember Chopik's line that, you know, it's, the problem is not that most people are evil, it's that most people are oafs. Uh, I don't know what the what Czech word's being translated there or German, depending on whether that passage was written in Czech or in German. Uh, Chopik wrote in both. Um, uh, so Hashek may be a little bit closer to Chopik on that point. Um, but these sort of represent three different ways that that libertarians and anarchists tend to think about authority figures like judges and police. Um, and you can say that each of those is true at some level or in some respect. Uh, each of those is, is picking out some genuine feature of, uh, of the power system. Uh, anyway, so, um, uh, uh, most of, um, of uh, Hashek's work is in the form of, of short stories. He wrote one novel, uh, Unfinished, um, The Adventures of the Good Soldier Schweik. Um, Kafka wrote three novels, The Process, The Trial, I mean, so the, the, the Trial, The Castle, Prozess is German for trial, the, the Trial, The Castle, and either America or The Disappeared Man, um, all unfinished. Chopic wrote lots and lots of novels, um, plus other stuff, plays and so forth. Uh, but all three of them wrote lots of short stories. But short stories were Hashek's main output. You know, so he has a short story called The Judicial Reform of Mr. Zakon, um, uh, where there's this bureaucrat who notices that although convicted criminals habitually promise the court that they will reform, such promises are very rarely kept. And the reason, he figures, is that the criminal regards the judge as merely the representative of a system of justice which is penal and therefore hostile to him. So this bureaucrat proposes the appointment as judges of criminals who would be the best known in ones in their circles on the grounds that the feeling of solidarity among criminals would make that promise binding and so bring about the reform of those unfortunates. Uh, the project is initially successful. It lowers the crime rate when the criminals are responsible to other criminals rather than to the judges for their promise to give up the life of crime. They give it up. Uh, uh, you know, when you, when, um, when you make criminals into judges, except that the incentive is that law-abiding people start taking up lives of crime in the hope of being appointed as judges. So a lot of his short stories are about some odd little strangeness of incentives of you know, imaginary bureaucratic laws or sometimes real ones, but uh, often uh, exa sometimes they're exaggerated real ones and they're just fantastic ones, but various uh, laws and so forth where the, the incentive turns out to be some kind of perverse uh, incentive, some sort of very, um, you know, very libertarian thing, very public choice kind of thing. Um, uh, an even more delicious story is the criminal strike. So the criminals go on strike for fair treatment. What does it mean for criminals to go on strike? Well, they refuse to commit any more crimes. So you might think that'd be great, but actually this is a disaster for the government. The importance of the counselors and officials of the criminal court starts to dwindle rapidly as all authorities, officials, as well as prison employees become redundant. Uh, you know, so the, um, you know, when criminals go on strike, uh, the crime rate falls. When the crime rate falls, then it seems like there's no, no more need for these government officials. So the government even gives serious thought to encouraging crime by awarding government grants to criminals. But finally, a mob of all the classes who are suffering as a result of the criminal strike which includes counselors of the law courts, secretaries, investigating magistrates, assistant judges, 
probationary lawyers, assistant prosecutors, police officials, defense counsels, they all start to riot, demanding work because they've been thrown out of work from the fact that there aren't any more criminals. However, hooray, riots are illegal. And because riots are illegal, you've suddenly got a whole bunch of new criminals. They can try these rioters. Uh, and so the courts go back into session and the justice system is saved. You know, so here you have like a fairly cynical uh, uh, you know, suggestion that the, you know, the government far from wanting to abolish crime desperately needs crime uh, in order to justify its own existence. Um, no, there's a short story called An Investigative Expedition, which is a police spy who is trying to trick a suspected malcontent into making disloyal remarks about the empire. But without success, as the intended victim keeps singing the empire's praises, but it's precisely his absurd, absurd insistence that he's living under an efficient administration that proves his obvious insincerity. Um, and you know, this story is, is sort of, it's of a piece with the good soldier Schweik. It's, uh, it's a very similar kind of dynamic. Um, um, yeah, another one of these catch 22 stories is a psychiatric puzzle where a patient is confined indefinitely to an insane asylum because the doctors have not yet been able to detect in him that awareness that he is mentally ill, which according to the psychiatric textbooks is the first sign of an improvement in a patient's mental condition. Of course, they had no evidence he's mentally ill to begin with. His only, the only evidence they have that he's mentally ill is that he hasn't yet admitted to being mentally ill. And only if you admit to being mentally ill can you show that you're on the sign of recovery from being mentally ill. Uh, of course, if he admits he's mentally ill, then there's, you know, they'd be justified in keeping him until they they judge him cured. Uh, you know, so it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. They like a rigged game, as Jack Nicholson says in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, another short story, an embarrassing situation in Ochsenhausen. Um, so the cabinet council suspects that their prince's mental health may not be all that it should be. So they call in a medical expert and sure enough, the medical expert testifies, yep, the prince has gone feeble minded. So the counselor of health, who's separate from the cabinet council, has the physician arrested for using insulting language towards his serene highness, since it's insulting to call the serene highness feeble-minded, even if that's a legitimate medical diagnosis, um, assuming that it is, who knows. Um, and so since the cabinet council is the one that hired this physician, the counselor of health declares the cabinet council conspirators and persons guilty of high treason. So the cabinet council responds by having the counselor of health arrested and turned on the grounds that he's the one who's, who's insulting the prince by suggesting that our ruler would take into his confidence conspirators and traitors. Well, of course, they're the ones who've just been claiming that the prince was feeble-minded, in which case he might very well do that. Um, but you know, it's insulting to the prince to suggest that our ruler would take into his confidence conspirators and traitors. So by accusing us of being conspirators and traitors, you're accusing the prince of, of poor judgment. And therefore, you're the one who is uh, 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 who is uh, guilty of insulting the prince, even though we're the ones who've been claiming that he's feeble-minded. Um, so now there's a stalemate. The, you can't get any more medical experts to, to testify uh, on either side because they fear being arrested, whichever side they take. If they, if a medical expert testifies that the prince is feeble-minded, uh, they worry that he worries that the Council of Health uh, will have been arrested. If he testifies that they're not, then that implies that the cabinet council is unreliable, which implies that the prince has chosen an unreliable cabinet council, which is insulting to the prince. So whatever the medical experts say is insulting to the prince. So no a, a medical expert wants to say anything. Um, uh, so the prime minister decides, well, so what? We don't need to do anything. We don't need to, re to uh, replace the feeble-minded ruler, just leave him in power. Because after all, his mental state has remained like this for a while now, and it hasn't actually make any difference. Um, everything runs pretty much the way it did before. Uh, the, the, mental, the mental state of the prince doesn't really seem to have that much impact on the way society runs. Uh, everything runs pretty much okay. Uh, and so we'll just stick with our feeble-minded ruler. Uh, uh, Kashuk was constantly in trouble with the law, as you may have suspected by now. Um, 
uh, more than um, uh, more than Chopek or Kafka. So Kafka didn't publish most of his stuff during his lifetime, so he wasn't in too much danger. And Chopek was uh, was good pals with the president, Thomas Masaryk, and uh, you know, so wasn't really in danger. But Hasek was constantly you know, running afoul of the law. Um, the Austrian customs. Uh, well, he's visiting Germany, a traveler from uh, uh, from uh, the. Uh, I'm not sure whether it was it was Czechoslovakia by that point, or whether it was uh, you know, so anyway from the Czech region of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Has a serious accident requiring emergency surgery, and part of what happens is he ends up with a silver plate in his skull and a pig's kidney transplanted to replace his own. When he tries to return to Bohemia, which is the the region of the, the Czech area where Prague is. He's denied re-entry by the customs officials since the importation of silver and of swine are both prohibited. So this is sort of a little parody about, uh, about um, uh, customs duties. Uh, the uh, Bakura scandal, and the Bakura scandal what happens is there's this bar whose toilets are decreed by the local regulators to have inadequate ventilation. So the owner is instructed to introduce windows into the toilets. So he says, all right, but I can't, I'm not allowed to do it unless I first receive a building permit. Uh, you know, so he's been ordered to put in the windows, but he hasn't gotten permission to put in the windows. He's been ordered by you know, these regulators um, uh, to put in the windows, but he hasn't gotten received from these regulators. Or actually, they may even be the same regulators, I forget. Um, he has to get permission. And so he complains. He says, here you are, you know, you're the state telling me that uh, I can't reopen my bar until I get ventilation in the toilets, but you won't give me the paperwork I need to put the windows in. And their response to him is, just you calm down or you might end up insulting an official person. You think it's a joyride for us going around looking at the urinals? So week after week, the owner begs for the authorization to put the uh, windows into uh, the uh, the restrooms in his bar, so that uh, he can uh, then be legally allowed to reopen it. And in fact, the official paperwork is is already is ready. But the official who's in charge of sending it to him just delays sending it. He just leaves it on the shelf and doesn't send it. Uh, and the reason is it's only an innkeeper. Let him wait a bit. We in the city council have got to keep these people firmly in their place. In other words, he's the um, uh, the bureaucrat could uh, could send the paperwork this guy needs, but he wants to keep him hanging because he doesn't want to jump to the uh, you know jump to the command of the this common person. He wants the common person to jump to his command. So you know, just keep him waiting. It can't hurt him, or can't hurt me anyway. Got to keep him in place. It, let him know his place. Uh, but then the same official is going out on a walk in town, and suddenly he has to use a toilet. Uh, and the nearest toilet uh, is a pay toilet, as most uh, as most toilets in in Prague were and are still today. Um, uh, a sort of interesting feature is that uh, uh, in in capitalist America, most public toilets are free, um, and in uh, in all these supposedly more socialist countries, uh, you have to pay. Uh, but when I was younger, uh, they used to, um, they didn't, they didn't have a, um, a person sitting in there uh, taking, um, you know, taking your money. Whereas in the Vatican, they have a nun sitting in the men's room, not just in front of the men's room, but actually in the men's room. And if she turned around, she could look right at the urinals. I thought it was very strange, taking your money. But they used to have automatic, uh, you know, they used to have uh, on, uh, on, the, oh, on each stall on the door, there'd be a little dime in which you would, uh, uh, you I mean, the little slot where you stick a dime in, and that would enable you to unlock the door, and uh, and get in. Um, they don't seem to have those very much in in the U.S. anymore. Um, uh, in fact, you know, that line that you used to see, uh, it, used, it used to be on the um, restroom walls. Here I sit, broken-hearted, paid a dime and only farted. Uh, the reason they're broken-hearted is that they wasted their dime. And now that um, 
uh, that people have uh, uh, have forgotten about the dimes. Now it's turned into here I sit brokenhearted, came to shit and only farted, which rhymes better. Um, but it's not clear why they're brokenhearted. Uh, why are you brokenhearted if you're, you know, we just thought you had to go to the bathroom, you didn't really. Uh, the original reason was that you're supposed to put the diamonds. So when I was, a, you know, when I was a kid, you'd see these, these, uh, these dime payment uh, public uh, restrooms everywhere. But now you don't. Uh, maybe some economist watching this can tell me uh, what the reason for that is. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, so he's, you know, so he doesn't have any money to pay for the public toilet, but he really needs to use it. So happens that the the, the attendant at the toilet is the sister of this barkeeper that he's been keeping on tenderhooks all this time. And so she lets him in for free, not out of the goodness of her heart, but hoping that this will, um, you know, this will make him ease up on her brother. And it works. Uh, uh, out, of, out of gratitude toward her, he finalizes the paperwork that he's been sitting on for a month. Um, uh, and then, of course, he's dismissed for taking a bribe. Uh, the bribe being that he did his job that he was supposed to do in exchange for the bribe of being allowed to use the public toilet. Uh, so kind of a general, this is a general satire of the uh, bureaucratic mentality. Uh, another short story by Hasek, Emperor Franz Josef's portrait. So during the war, this man is selling portraits of the emperor and he advertises them with the blurb in these difficult days, no Czech home should be without its portrait of our severely tried monarch. This is during the war. Um, and then the police come and reprimand him. This is, saying, this is a very pessimistic assessment of the war effort. They talk about our monarch as being severely tried and they talking about these difficult days suggests that the war is going badly, that's unpatriotic. Uh, so you have to change it. So he changes difficult and severely tried to glorious and victorious. Uh, you know, in these glorious days, no Czech home should be without his portrait of our victorious monarch. And then the police threaten him once again, saying, well, given that obviously the war is going pretty badly for us, describing this as glorious and victorious, uh, Gloria, Victoria, there's a musical digression for you. Um, uh, anyway, um, yeah, he's trivializing the empire's losses. And so uh, he's in trouble for that. So he's not allowed to use any blurb because one blurb, you know, if, you're, if, you, if you're honest and say that the war is going badly, uh, you, um, uh, you're being unpatriotic. But if you say the war is going well, then you are trivializing the, uh, the, the war losses of the empire. So he's not allowed to use either ad. So nobody buys the portraits. So he reduces the price to two crowns which I think is also a play on words. I think it's a play on words that works in, in Czech as well as in English, because uh, a crown is, is the basic currency uh, of, um, of um, Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia or Bohemia or whatever it is at any given point in the story. But two crowns is also a reference to the Kaiserlich and Königlich uh, character of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which combines the Austrian crown with the uh, Hungarian crown. Uh, but anyway, he reduces the price to two crowns, which is you know, much cheaper than what he'd been doing for. And so now he's finally imprisoned because he's insulting the emperor for selling the, the, um, these portraits at such a low price. Of course, he can't find any, any takers at the higher price, particularly since he's not allowed to use either of the two advertisements that he had developed. So in The Good Soldier Schweik, there's a similar story. Uh, another one of these catch 22s that um, that Schweik loves. Uh, so there's a barkeeper who has a portrait of the emperor on the wall, but he discovers that flies have been pooping on it. And so he thinks, well, I don't want to keep this up there because it's got fly poop on it and somebody might, make, might be so free as to pass a remark about it and then there could be unpleasantness. It should be then there, not the there. Um, I'm not sure why he can't clean the fly poop off, but anyway, uh, so he takes it down and puts it away. But then of course he gets in trouble with the local police spies for having taken the emperor's portrait down. It seems unpatriotic. You had the, the portrait up, now you've taken it down. 
how dare you? What does that mean? It's not, it's like, you know, uh, you know, when politicians get in trouble nowadays for not in the US for not wearing their flag pin. Um, you anyway, he gets in trouble for having taken the emperor's portrait down. So he explains his reason for taking it down. He says, well, it was covered with fly poop. So I had to take it down. So he's arrested because he referred to fly poop in connection with the emperor. And you know that is uh, offensive. So if he doesn't explain why he did it, then he's interpreted as taking it down out of disrespect for the emperor. And so he gets in trouble. But if he does explain why he did it, then he's, the explanation connects the emperor with fly poop and that's disrespectful. So any, whatever explanation he gives or any or none is disrespectful. And so he uh, will be arrested. Well, this brings us to the good soldier speak, uh, which is Hashik's best known work. That's a, an anti-war classic. Uh, it's often known by its German title, The Good Soldier Schweik, spelled S-C-H-W-E-I-K or C-K, I forget which. But anyway, Schweik is the, the proper and correct uh, uh, Czech spelling and pronunciation. Um, uh, the Good Soldier Schweik is in one respect reminiscent of Kafka's The Trial. And in both cases, uh, the main character ends up at the beginning of the story being arrested and seized by various authorities uh, and, uh, and um, being subjected to uh, various kinds of interrogation by bureaucrats and so forth. But the big, big difference is that unlike K in Kafka story, uh, and a number of Kafka stories actually, Schweik doesn't wriggle helplessly in the clutches of bureaucrats. Instead, he outwits and frustrates them by playing the role of an amiable, bumbling idiot. And it's, all, it's never quite clear to what extent he's playing the role and what extent he really is one. Um, it's sort of a systematic ambiguity uh, in the book. Um, but he blocks his superiors at every turn through verbatim compl compliance. He does exactly what they say. Um, and you know, you know, sort of work to rule. You slow everything down by doing exactly what they tell you in a systematic way as possible. Also, he's constantly misunderstanding the orders or at least pretending to. It's not clear always whether he really misunderstands them or whether he's pretending to, but anyway, he keeps obeying the orders in ways that they did not intend, um, uh, which is sort of a way of dramatizing the ruler's dependence on the ruled, that the ruler's orders you know, depend on the ruled uh, you know, playing along with the same game and Schweik is always playing a different game. Uh, Again, whether by intention or by um, or by accident, is systematically unclear. Is he, you know, is he really, uh, you know, this naive sort of pure fool uh, who just slides through all these, uh, you know, slides through all this authoritarian stuff because he's too naive to understand what's going on, and so he doesn't pick up on the signals, and so he just slides around them. Or is he, you know, crazy like a fox and deliberately trying to deceive them? You could read it, read it either way, systematically. Uh, you know, on the left there, I've got uh, uh, you know, throughout. It's a, it's a bar in um, uh, in Prague that has uh, you know, famous image of a couple of famous images of Schweik on it. But you can find lots of bars in. Um, in Prague, they have famous images of, of Schweik on them. It's a very common thing. Uh, and I think that probably uh, uh, Hasek would appreciate that uh, tribute. Uh, since Hasek was very fond of uh, the raising of the wrist, so to speak. Uh, anyway, um, they, you know, after interrogating him, they finally decide that he's, in, that he's mentally ill uh, and the grounds are these, the undersigned medical experts certify the complete mental feebleness and congenital idiocy of Josef Schweik, who appeared before, you know, interesting, it's an interesting parallel between Josef K, Kafka's protagonist, and Josef Schweik, which ends with a K. I think it's just a coincidence, but it's kind of a cool coincidence. Schweik, who appeared before the aforesaid commission and expressed himself in such terms as, long live our emperor Franz Josef I which utterance is sufficient to il illuminate the state of mind of, this should be of, not as, of Josef Schweik as that of a patent imbecile. Uh, 
In other words, his very expressions of, of patriotism show what an idiot he is. So again, it's both, it's, it's a catch-22 thing, but anyway, it means that he ends up in the military hospital for a while instead of, instead of being conscripted into the army. Now he does get conscripted into the army eventually, but he ends up in the middle hospital for a while because he, uh, they're convinced that he's uh, mentally ill. Um, so during the, uh, the communist regime in um, the time of the communist regime in uh, Czechoslovakia, Gustav Husak, who was the general secretary of the communist party in the 1970s, uh, used to issue a command to the population, stop shvaking. So the idea is that this, this kind of uh, pretending to obey the rules, but obeying them in some sort of evasive uh, way where you, it's not open defiance, but you are sort of sliding around the rules and not really complying with them, but you're seem, you seem so earnestly to be complying with them, but you're doing everything you can to, to screw them up. Uh, you know, that became known as shvaking and the, uh, you know, the communist regime didn't, didn't like it. And so uh, you know, was complaining about this as a, um, uh, as a problem uh, in, uh, uh, in Czech society. So uh, now I want to sub, that's the last of the slides, but as with the previous two videos, I want to supplement uh, the slides with uh, some excerpts from the unfinished uh, written uh, version of this paper that has more stuff and will uh, inshallah eventually have still more stuff. Uh, so, you know, Hashek writes this semi-autobiographical, a lot of his, his stories are semi-autobiographical, it's not always clear how far they are and how far they aren't, but in his story, my friend uh, uh, Hanushka, uh, he tells about being cross-examined about a street demonstration during which a police officer had, by an unfortunate coincidence, fallen on my walking stick, hitting his head, which you may think is not the most accurate description of what happened. Uh, um, another of the um, uh, the proposals of his party of the moderate progress within the limit within the bounds of law, which was uh, this is from the manifesto of the party, he explains that the party drew inspiration from Christopher Columbus, who showed himself to be guided by the principles of moderate progress within the limits of the law, by the fact that he first uh, involved, uh, asked the royal authorities for permission before sailing to America. Only afterwards was it necessary to kill off the Indians, to introduce slavery, and thus bring about progress everywhere slowly and gradually. So more of his political satire. Uh, and in one of his electoral campaign speeches, he's, he urges uh, party members to cultivate the sextons of neighborhood churches since these have free access to the funeral offices and consequently to the lists of dead voters. For when a campaign is generous, generously financed, then a dead voter knows very well what his duty will be at the ballot box. Uh, um, then another one of his, his catch 22 stories is uh, that a robber carries out his crime with more than usual brutality uh, and the reason he's so cranky when he carries out the crime is that prior to his crime, he hadn't eaten for three days. But the reason he hadn't eaten for three days is he wanted to be able to maintain he had stolen the loaf of bread out of hunger. And if he ate before stealing it, then it would be clear he wasn't stealing out of hunger. So he deliberately refrains from eating it so in order to get the, in order to be able to say that he stole it out of hunger. Um, but then that makes him extra cranky. And so he carries it out of crime with more than usual brutality. So this is another one of these sort of weird bureaucratic incentive things, which doesn't seem to be uh, parodying any particular provision of weird bureaucratic misunderstanding of incentives, but seems to be sort of parodying the general idea. Uh, in, um, uh, in Father Andre's sin, uh, a priest arriving at the pearly gates is sentenced to 15,000 years in purgatory. And the sin that, that uh, for which he's been punished is that he posted a letter to Australia. Um, 
Why is that a sin? Because it was in contravention of St. Augustine's denial of the existence of the Antipodes. Uh, and when he's upset, the angel tells him in order to console him, don't cry, you could have had something like that happen to you in any court on earth. Um, you know, so that's sort of similar to um, you know, Kafka's line about you know, this, you know, this unfair thing that happens to the elevator boy could have happened in, you know, in any courtroom you know, in any country. Um, although you know, the mood is different, uh, you know, the, the mood of the Kafka story is one of grim despair, whereas the mood of the Hashik story is, is one of the satirical. Although, you know, I say that, but in fact, Kafka himself apparently thought of his own stories as hilarious, because he'd read them aloud to people he couldn't stop laughing. Um, so Kafka seems to have experienced his stories somewhat differently from the way his readers often experience them. As you know, when you're reading Hashek, it's clear this is funny. Um, when you're reading Kafka, you, you feel this mood of grim despair, but Kafka himself seemed to, seemed to have thought that his stories were a laugh riot. Um, Anyway, uh, there's another um, there's another short story by Hashek, The Unfortunate Affair of the Tomcat, in which there's a bureaucratic decree that a cat be euthanized, but because of an ambiguity of the wording or some problem with the punctuation by those charged with enforcing it, it's read as uh, inquiring that the cat's owner be euthanized. And so of course you have to follow the letter of the law uh, or their interpretation of it, and so they had to euthanize the owner of the cat rather than the cat um, because of this bureaucratic error. Uh, you know, then his short story, the, the party treasurer, Eduard Drobilek, uh, this vagabond encounters a police officer who inquires the vagabond's business with that gentle sarcasm of which only gendarmes are capable when they meet a suspicious individual in the night hours. But the vagabond turns the tables on the officer, telling them that he suspects that the gendarme is no gendarme at all, but some rogue in, in disguise, since he has failed in his first sacred duty, which was to ask to see my documents. Moreover, the officer is apparently unaware of the recent decree of May 12, 1901, which the vagabond is presumably making up on the spot, which requires police officers to pay five crowns to traveling officials. And so the vagabond ends up walking off with uh, the intimidated officer's apologies and his spare change too. Um, and this theme, this theme of, uh, of someone being interrogated by the authorities and turning the tables on them and someone convincing them you know, to be more afraid that they're violating some bureaucratic rule is, is something that happens in, in several of his stories. Um, then going back to the good soldier Schweik, uh, the, uh, the famous opening line of the good soldier Schweik, uh, has Schweik's charwoman, Mrs. Mueller, come to deliver him the news that Archduke Ferdinand has just been assassinated at Sarajevo, which of course is the act that ends up triggering the chain of events that results in the First World War. Um, uh, and what she says is, uh, and forgive my mispronunciation, I do not speak Czech. Taknam uh, Zabuli Ferdinanda, um, which is a difficult to translate nuance of Czech grammar there. Um, uh, the um, uh, literally, it, it, the, the nam in there literally means, you know, that it, it describes the killing of Ferdinand as something specifically done to us and us that presumptively includes both Schweik and Mueller. As though she were saying something like, so they've killed Ferdinand at us, um, which doesn't make sense in English, but that's sort of a way of capturing it. You know, they've done this to us, that they've killed Ferdinand. Uh, one popular translation has, so they've killed our Ferdinand. Another uh, translation uh, sort of expands it. So they've done it to us, they've killed our Ferdinand. Uh, neither of those quite captures the nuance of the check, but it, it's hard to do it in idiomatic English. Anyway, Schweik immediately responds in such a way as to dismiss the suggestion that he is part of any us for whom Ferdinand is ours and has lost our loss. So he says, which Ferdinand, Mrs. Mueller? I know two Ferdinands. One is a messenger at Bruce's and once by mistake, he drank a bottle of hair oil there. And another is Ferdinand Kokoschka who collects dog manure. 
neither of them is any loss. So Mrs. Mueller explains that she means no, no, neither of them. She means the Archduke Ferdinand. Rochefe quickly shows by his decidedly untearful response that he regards this Ferdinand as no great loss either. He says, you know, potting at an imperial highness is no easy job, you know. It's not like a poacher potting at a gamekeeper. The question is how you get at him. You can't get near a fine gentleman like that if you're dressed in rags. You've got to wear a topper so the cops don't nab you beforehand. There's some revolvers, Mrs. Miller, that won't go off even if you bust yourself. There are lots of that type. I'd buy a Browning for a job like that. It looks like a toy, but in a couple of minutes, you can shoot 20 archdukes with it. Uh, you know, and then, you know, I'm not going to go through all the various amusing things to be found in, in that novel, but uh, one other humorous thing is there's this, um, uh, when he finally ends up in the, you know, in the military, there's this uh, guy who insists that uh, that latrine duty is the most important thing because this kind of discipline is what's going to make victory possible. And he says, uh, victory will crawl out of, uh, the, the Austrian victory will crawl out of the latrines. Uh, one of the best descriptions of Hasek's writings is comes from a description in Chopek that is not a description of Hasek, a description of the impudence of sparrows. But I'm going to quote it here because it so perfectly describes the spirit of Hasek. So here's what Chopek says about sparrows. And I don't think that he had any, you know, I don't think this was a code for anybody. I think he's just talking about sparrows. Uh, Chopek has many things he talks about. The sparrow is the most human of birds. He has no personal property. He has for other sparrows a feeling of equality and comradeship. As a consequence of this, he enjoys fighting and quarreling with them. His society has no deeper organization. It is only a small group, something like the bunch of regular clients at a restaurant, held together by common ownership of a dung heap, residents in the same neighborhood, reciprocal exchange of jokes, sexual promiscuity, and innate love of chatter. Although he has no sense of property, he is a local patriot and flings himself with yells and curses on sparrows from a couple of streets away. He is full of public interests. His world is the street. He hates to be alone, but is not capable of collective discipline or barrack life. He has a nest of his own, but his life is shared with his fellow diners. He is too carefree to succeed in developing in himself a more logical egoism. If he shares every dung heap with his comrades, it is not from a feeling of duty, but so as to have someone to chat with. Well, that description of sparrows that Chopek gives really does remind me of Hasek. Um, one last point uh, uh, about schwaking. Uh, you know, a couple of passages, one from James Van Heise's uh, article, Civilian Resistance in Czechoslovakia, and one from John Keane's book on, uh, on uh, Václav Havel, A Political Tragedy in Six Acts. Um, describing the way that the Czech populace responded to uh, the invasion of the Soviet tanks uh, as the termination of the Prague Spring. Um, Traveling in Czechoslovakia was a nightmare for the Warsaw Pact troops. The Czechs had removed street signs and painted over building address numbers. Many small villages renamed themselves Dubček or Svoboda. Um, Dubček was the name of one of the the leading politicians behind the Prague Spring. Svoboda means essentially freedom. So the, the villages all give themselves these same names so that uh, the people in the tanks can't figure out where the heck they are. In rural areas, it was not uncommon to see a troop convoy stalled at a crossroad, the commander scratching his head over an open map. And then once they got into uh, Prague, wrong directions and information about the town's buildings were given systematically helping to foil the invaders, forcing them to retrace their steps, and even on one occasion to fire on themselves. During the first night of occupation, uh, the populace carefully removed all the street signs and neatly stacked them in front of the town hall. You know, um, you know, so this kind of, you know, it's not like taking up arms to fight the oppressor, but just sort of screwing with the oppressor um, uh, um, and subverting them and uh, sabotaging them in a sort of a playful, but at the same time, very serious 
uh, way. Uh, that sort of fits a lot of uh, you know what happens in a lot of in a lot of uh, Hasek stories, in particular with Sveik. Although, as I said, it's not always clear whether Sveik uh, is doing this intentionally, uh, you know, pretending to be an idiot in order to misunderstand commands and and uh, evade whatever it is that his, the authorities want and uh, just them up, or whether he really is uh, a naive uh, fool. Uh, it's really supposed to be. Uh, I think it's supposed to be ambiguous throughout, uh, but um, but the point is that the authorities simply cannot maintain their authority when people act that way. And so once again, you get the same message, although in a more lighthearted vein than in Kafka, despite Kafka's own own, own gales of laughter over his own writings, uh, in a more lighthearted vein, seemingly at any rate, this idea that the power of the rulers depends on the ruled playing the game. And Schweik, whether intentionally or unintentionally, just systematically fails to play the game. And you know, one clear implication is that if enough people were systematically failing to play the game the way that Schweik is failing to, um, then uh, the, the ruling authorities would not be able to, uh, to maintain their power. Um, which is a very anarchist message from the only one of these three writers who actually was a committed anarchist to the extent that Hasek was committed to anything um, uh, besides drinking. Um, uh, he was actually you know, a convinced anarchist anyway, uh, in a way that, um, that Kafka and Chopik weren't, although they both were sympathetic uh, to anarchism. Um, so anyway, those are my three uh, Prague authors. Uh, that you know, they're quite different from each other, but they have a lot of Austrian and libertarian and anarchist themes. Um, you know, some of them, you know, more sort of capitalist oriented, some of them more social oriented, some of them kind of hard to categorize, but um, uh, you know, the three I, authors I find really fascinating. And although Kafka is pretty widely read uh, in the West, Chopik and Hashik are left so. I mean, people do read them, but um, they're not completely obscure, but um, uh, um, they're not as wide, widely read as they uh, as they should be. And I am I'm a big fan of all three authors, and I'm a big fan of Prague, and I'm a big fan of the Prague Conference on Political Economy, where I presented a much, 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 much shorter version of this presentation. Uh, uh, but it's also when I get a chance to go. Uh, to Prague for that conference, or for any reason, but you know, it's so uh, it's for the conference that I go, both because it's a delightful conference, uh, and I like I like talking to libertarian-oriented students from all over Europe that I get to hang out with at those conferences, and um, and also like uh, talking with Joseph Shima, who's the uh, um, the head of that outfit. Um, but also, if I'm going to the conference, then my department will will pay my way uh, to Prague. Uh, and otherwise, I, I don't so easily get there. Um, but anyway, so I love Prague. I love these authors. I, uh, you know, I love their uh, their libertarian connections. But uh, you know, even apart from that, they're just really fascinating uh, reading. Uh, they can be read on more than one level. Well, maybe Hasek not as much as uh, Kafka and Chopek. Hashik may not be quite as complex, um, but still delightful. Um, and you know, so I want to put in a uh, uh, a plug uh, for them, and also just a plug for the um, you know, the Prague Conference on Political Economy. If you've got a chance to go to it, go. Um, you've got a chance get a chance to present to it. If you're if you're an academic, then you can you know get some funding to go for it. If you're a if you're a student, or well, maybe you could get funding from, I don't know, the Institute for Humane Studies or something like that to go there. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a delightful conference. It's a delightful city. Um, uh, and um, you know, it's a, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, the conference is, you know, is more right libertarian on the whole than I am. Um, and they have a wide range of sort of right libertarian things from, you know, sort of from the, um, 
from the Mises crowd to the uh, the GMU crowd, it's uh, and so on. It's uh, it, it's not just one flavor, um, but it's it's still uh, a lot of fun and uh, Prague is great. Um, um, anyway, so uh, I guess that is all I have to say on uh, on those three authors in Prague, and so. Uh, no. Until next time, like, share, subscribe. Um, consider supporting on PayPal on Patreon. And I will see you next time.